Chapter 1 Reuben January 1992 The woman smiled so politely that he felt offended. Let me tell Principal Morgan that you're here, Mr. St. Clair. She'll want to talk with you. She walked two steps, turned back. She likes to talk to everyone, I mean. Any new teacher. Of course. He should have been used to this by now. More than three minutes later, she emerged from the principal's office, smiling too widely, too openly. People always display far too much acceptance, he noticed, when they're having trouble mustering any for real. Go right on in, Mr. St. Clair. She'll see you. Thank you. The principal appeared to be about ten years older than Reuben, with a great deal of dark hair, worn up, a Caucasian, and attractive. We are so pleased to meet you face to face, Mr. St. Clair. Then she flushed, as if the mention of the word face had been an unforgivable error. Please, call me Reuben. Reuben, yes, and I'm Anne. She met him with a steady, head-on gaze, and at no time appeared startled. She had been verbally prepared by her assistant, and somehow, the only thing worse than an unprepared reaction was the obviously rehearsed absence of one. He hated these moments so. She motioned toward a chair, and he sat. I'm not quite what you were expecting, am I, Anne? In what respect? Please, don't do this. You must appreciate how many times I've replayed this same scene. I can't bear to talk around an obvious issue. She tried to establish eye contact as one normally would when addressing a co-worker in a conversation, but she could not make it stick. You know this has nothing to do with your being African-American, she said. Oh, yes, he said. I do know that. I know exactly what it's about. If you're thinking your position is in any jeopardy, Reuben, you're worrying for nothing. Do you really have this little talk with everyone? Of course I do. Before they even address their first class? Pause. Not necessarily. I just thought we might discuss the subject of initial adjustment. You worry that my appearance will alarm the students. What has been your experience with that in the past? The students are always easy, Anne. This is the difficult moment. Always. I understand. With all respect, I'm not sure you do, he said. Out loud. At his former school in Cincinnati, Reuben had a friend named Lou Tartaglia. Lou had a special way of addressing an unfamiliar class. He would enter on the first morning with a yardstick in his hand, walk right into the flap, and fray. They liked to test a teacher, you see, at first. He would ask for silence, which he never received on the first request. After counting to three, he would bring this yardstick up over his head and smack it down on the desktop in such a way that it would break in two. The free half would fly up into the air behind him, hit the blackboard, and clatter to the floor. Then, in the audible silence to follow, he would say simply, Thank you. And he'd have no trouble with the class after that. Reuben warned him that someday a piece would fly in the wrong direction and hit a student, causing a world of problems. But it had always worked as planned, so far as he knew. It boils down to unpredictability, Lou explained. Once they see you as unpredictable, you hold the cards. Then he asked what Reuben did to quiet an unfamiliar and unruly class, and Reuben replied that he had never experienced the problem. He had never been greeted with anything but stony silence and was never assumed to be predictable. Oh, right, Lou said, as if he should have known better. And he should have. Reuben stood before them for the first time, both grateful and resentful of their silence. Outside the windows on his right was California, a place he'd never been before. The trees were different. The sky did not say winter as it had when he started the long drive from Cincinnati. He wouldn't say from home because it was not his home, not really, and neither was this. He'd grown tired of feeling like a stranger. 
He performed a quick head count, seats per row, number of rows. Since I can see you're all here, he said, we will dispense with the roll call. It seemed to break a spell that he spoke, and the students shifted a bit, made eye contact with each other, whispered across aisles, neither better nor worse than usual. He turned away to write his name on the board, Mr. St. Clair. Also wrote it out underneath, St. Clair, as an aid to pronunciation. Then he paused before turning back so they would have time to finish reading his name. In his mind, his plan, he thought he'd start right off with the assignment. But it caved from under him, like skidding down the side of a sand dune. He was not Lou. And sometimes people needed to know him first. Sometimes he was startling enough on his own, before his ideas even showed themselves. Maybe we should spend the first day, he said, just talking, since you don't know me at all. We can start by talking about appearances. How we feel about people because of how they look. There are no rules. You can say anything you want. Apparently, they did not believe him yet because they said the same things they might have with their parents looking on, to his disappointment. Then, in what was supposed to be an attempt at humor, a boy in the back row asked if he was a pirate. No, he said, I'm not. I'm a teacher. I thought only pirates wore eye patches. People who have lost their eyes wear eye patches, whether they're pirates or not is beside the point. The class filed out, to his relief, and he looked up to see a boy standing in front of his desk, a thin, white boy, but very dark-haired, possibly part Hispanic, who said, Hi. Hello. What happened to your face? Reuben smiled, which was rare for him being self-conscious about the lopsided effect. He pulled a chair around so the boy could sit facing him and motioned for him to sit which he did without hesitation. What's your name? Trevor. Trevor what? McKinney. Did I hurt your feelings? No, Trevor, you didn't. My mom says I shouldn't ask people things like that because it might hurt their feelings. She says you should act like you didn't notice. Well, what your mom doesn't know, Trevor, because she's never been in my shoes, is that if you act like you didn't notice... I still know that you did. And then it feels strange that we can't talk about it when we're both thinking about it. Know what I mean? I think so. So what happened? I was injured in a war. Vietnam? That's right. My daddy was in Vietnam. He says it's a nightmare. I would tend to agree, even though I was there for only seven weeks. My daddy was there two years. Was he injured? Maybe a little. I think he has a sore knee. I was supposed to stay two years, but I got hurt so badly I had to come home. So, in a way, I was lucky that I didn't have to stay. And in a way, your daddy was lucky because he didn't get hurt that badly, if you know what I mean. The boy didn't look too sure that he did. Maybe someday I'll meet your dad, maybe on parents' night. I don't think so. We don't know where he is. What's under your eye patch? Nothing. How can it be nothing? It's like nothing was ever there. Do you want to see? You bet. Reuben took off the patch. No one seemed to know quite what he meant by nothing until they saw it. No one seemed prepared for the shock of nothing where there would be an eye on everyone else they had ever met. The boy's head rocked back a little. Then he nodded. Kids were easier. Reuben replaced the patch. Sorry about your face, but you know it's only just that one side. The other side looks real good. Thank you, Trevor. I think you're the first person to offer me that compliment. Well, see ya. Goodbye, Trevor. Reuben moved to the window and looked out over the front lawn, watched students clump, and talk and run on the grass until Trevor appeared, trotting down the front steps. It was ingrained in Reuben to defend this moment, and he could not have returned to his desk if he tried. 
He needed to know if Trevor would run up to the other boys to flaunt his new knowledge, to collect on any bets, or tell any tales which Reuben would not hear, only imagine from his second floor perch, his face flushing under the imagined words. But Trevor trotted past the boys without so much as a glance, stopping to speak to no one. It was almost time for Reuben's second class to arrive, so he had to get started, preparing himself to do it all over again. From The Other Faces Behind the Movement by Chris Chandler. Reuben, there's nothing monstrous or grotesque about my face. I get to state this with a certain objectivity, being perhaps the only one capable of such. I'm the only one used to seeing it, because I'm the only one who dares, with the help of a shaving mirror, to openly stare. I have undergone 11 operations in all to repair what was, at one time, unsightly damage. The area that was my left eye and the lost bone and muscle under cheek and brow have been neatly covered with skin removed from my thigh. I have endured numerous skin grafts and plastic surgeries. Only a few of these were necessary for health or function. Most were intended to make me an easier individual to meet. The final result is a smooth, complete absence of an eye, as if one had never existed a great loss of muscle and mass in cheek and neck, and obvious nerve damage to the left corner of my mouth. It is dead, so to speak, and droops. But after many years of speech therapy, my speech is fairly easily understood. So, in a sense, it's not what people see in my face that disturbs them, but rather what they expect to see and do not. I also have minimal use of my left arm, which is foreshortened and thin from lack of use, and I am deaf in one ear. My guess is that people rarely notice this until I've been around a while, because my face tends to steal the show. I've worked in schools, lounged in staff rooms where a band-aid draws comment and requires explanation. Richie, what'd you do to your hand? A cast on an arm becomes a story told for six weeks, multiplied by the number of employees. Well, I was on this stepladder, see, preparing to clean my storm drains. So it seems odd to me that no one will ask. If they suddenly did and I were forced to repeat the story, I might decide I liked things better before. But it's not so much that they don't ask, but why they don't ask. As if I am an unspeakable tragedy, as new and shocking to myself as to them. From the Diary of Trevor I like the new teacher. I don't know what the deal is with the other kids in my class. Even Joe, who's my friend. They all just stared at him like he was from outer space. At least Joe didn't laugh when Mr. St. Clair wasn't looking. And the weird thing is, I don't think most of it was his face. I mean, it was, at first. But then he started talking, and you could sort of feel that almost everybody got used to it. A little. But then he wrote that assignment on the board. He wrote it in really big capital letters, like the blackboard was yelling at us. Think of an idea for world change and put it into action. Man, was it ever quiet in that room. Finally, Jamie, this girl who's usually really shy, said, Um, what is that? Mr. St. Clair said, It's an assignment for extra credit. More silence. This guy named Jack, who's much cooler than me, and has lots more friends, said, We're supposed to change the world for social studies class? Isn't that a little... hard? You're supposed to think of an idea that might change the world and set it in motion. Whether or not the world actually changes is not part of the assignment. Then Arnie, who always likes trouble, said, That's still the hardest assignment anybody ever gave us. We're a bunch of kids. What do you want from us? I want you to think, Mr. St. Clair said. The first word in this assignment is think. So far you're arguing, not thinking. That said, if it feels like too much, bear in mind it's for extra credit. It's not required. But I already totally knew that I was going to do it. I looked around at all the kids in my class. I had to look over one shoulder at a time because I always sit in the front row. Everybody was just staring at that sentence on the board. Some of the kids looked like they were concentrating, but frowning. 
And then two of the guys looked away and started whispering to each other, like something was funny. I looked at my friend Joe, but he just looked totally confused. I wondered if I was the only one who was going to give the assignment a try. And if so, why? Chapter 2 Arlene Ricky never exactly came home, not like she thought he would, but the truck did, only not like she thought it would. It had been rolled a few times. All in all, it looked worse than she felt, only it ran. Well, it idled. It's one thing to start up and run, quite another to actually get somewhere. Much as she resented that Ford Extra cab for imitating her own current condition, she could have forgiven it that. Potentially she could. It was the way it kept her awake at night, especially now when she'd taken a second job at the Lester Lounge to keep up the payments. And since it was the truck's fault that she didn't get to bed until three, it at least could have let her sleep. Surely that would have not been asking too much. Yet, there she was again at the window, double-checking the way the moonlight slid off the vehicle's spooky shape. The way its silvery reflection broke where the paint broke. Only Ricky could mess up a truck that bad and walk away. At least it would stand a reason he had walked away, seeing that the truck was found and Ricky was not. Dragged off by coyotes? Stop, Arlene. Just get a hold of yourself. Unless, of course, he limped away, not sauntered off, maybe dragged himself to a hospital, maybe got out okay, maybe died far from anything to tie him to a Ford Extra cab, far from any ties to hometown news. So, there could be a grave somewhere. But how would Arlene know? And even if she did, she could not know which one or where. Even if she bought flowers for Ricky out of her tip money, she and her boy Trevor would never know where to put them. Flowers can be a bad thing, a bad thought, if you don't even know where to lay them down. Just stop, Arlene. Just go back to bed. And she did. But she fell victim to a dream in which Ricky had been living just outside of town for months and months and never bothered to contact her with his whereabouts. Which made her cross to the window again to blame the darn truck for keeping her awake. From the Diary of Trevor Sometimes I think my father never went to Vietnam. I don't even know why I think that. I just do. Joe's father went to Vietnam and he tells stories. And you can tell just by the stories that he really did go. I think my father maybe just says things sometimes that he thinks will make people proud of him or feel sorry for him. My mom feels sorry for him because he went to Vietnam. She says no wonder he has problems, so I don't tell her that I think maybe he never did. Mr. St. Clair is so cool. I don't care what Arnie says. I think he's great, and I'm going to do such a great job on that assignment, Mr. St. Clair won't even be able to believe it. <laughs>